It is a pleasure to welcome everyone this afternoon to Rallyevu, a tribute to the New Orleans Tribune and L'Union. This afternoon's event is the culmination of many years of effort on the part of Mark Rudinay and many organizations and institutions in this community to gain recognition for the New Orleans Tribune. To begin, we have some words of welcome from Mr. John Lawrence, who is the Director of Museum Programs here at the Historic New Orleans Collection. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to just offer the briefest welcome to you uh, and to welcome you to the Historic New Orleans Collection's Williams Research Center. Uh, we have a full house and a full program, so uh, I, I don't want to take any more time than necessary. But um, before, um, I, I, could not, um, I could not leave this podium without addressing a related event to uh, the program we're here to enjoy today, and that is um, to visit the exhibition in the adjacent building sometimes before, sometime before it closes in December, or perhaps to revisit it. It's a wonderful exhibit, African Heritage in New Orleans, 300 Years in the Making by the New Orleans Art and Culture Coalition. So um, please keep that on your calendar to, uh, uh, to do. The, um, uh, many of our uh, staff members and a member of our board are here today. They can talk to you uh, about the historic New Orleans collection and um, uh, give you more information about us as an organization uh, that might coincide with your interests in history, genealogy, or just uh, celebrating being in New Orleans. The um, program today is uh, a focus on the history, the importance, and the continuing influence of African American press in New Orleans. And with that, very broad brush and briefest of descriptions. I would now like to ask Alexandre Vialou, pre president of Alliance Francaise de la Nouvelle Orléans, to come to the podium to continue the program. Thank you for being at the historic New Orleans collection. We're delighted to have you here. Bonjour. Thank you, John. Chers amis, bonjour. It is a real honor for me as a board chairman of the Alliance Francaise de la Nouvelle Orléans to be amongst you this afternoon to celebrate what is certainly one of the greatest accomplishments of the city of New Orleans' 300-year-old history. By publishing L'Union and La Tribune de la Nouvelle Orléans in both French and English, Dr. Louis-Charles Roudanet was successful in his mission to ignite his readers to effect positive change, because, in part because he was able to reach a wide audience that expanded beyond New Orleans to the rest of the United States and France. I'd like to congratulate La Creole for making this occasion a reality, and particularly Dr. Elizabeth Rhodes, also Vice President of the Alliance Française de la Nouvelle Orléans, for the invitation. Dr. Rhodes introduced our organization to the remarkable history, and we had, to this remarkable history, and we had the honor of hosting Mark Rudanet to one of our events so that we can better understand the significance of the journey that led to today. Like L'Union and La Tribune de la Nouvelle Orléans, the Alliance Française de la Nouvelle Orléans was founded more than 100 years ago. I believe that we share one enduring quality. We exist to erase the artificial differences between people. So, félicitations encore de la part de l'Alliance Française de la Nouvelle Orléans pour la réalisation de ce moment si important et si historique. Thank you. Je vous remercie, Monsieur Vialu. And at this time, we will have some words of welcome from, uh, on behalf of one of the principal co-sponsors of this afternoon's event, the Louisiana Creole Research Association, by its president, Dr. Elizabeth Moore Rhodes, who is a retired assistant professor at Xavier, at Xavier University of Louisiana. Dr. Rose. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this event, sponsored by La Creole Research Association. As a member of the board, many of whom are present today, and could you just stand so I could just recognize you, the members of the La Creole board? Chantel, Eva, Curtis, Mark, Marva, our newest member, and Curtis, I mentioned Curtis, did I get everybody? Marva, I mentioned Marva. 
I'm sorry? Armin. Armin Devisand, is he here? Yeah, he's back there. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I couldn't see him back there. So, as a member of the board and as uh, president of the organization, I'm thankful to you for joining our fund and friend raising efforts. I am particularly thankful to the volunteer members of our association, we're all volunteers, um, who work tremendously hard to bring you this speakers forum, this marker unveiling, and the festivities related. Rallyez-vous, bienvenue. We are happy you have joined us. Today's event commemorates the achievement and resistance efforts of a few persons over 150 years ago who tirelessly worked for justice. They did this in the building right next door on this other side of this wall. Right? Because that's the street. I think this is the ball game. Uh, so today you will hear about the men from our speakers, about their achievements and their resistance efforts. Um, and you'll hear them in historical context. You may be challenged to think differently about the past and the future. I believe the rallying cries of our ancestors are echoed today as we continue to fight for justice in this country. The call to join, the call that our the call of our ancestors to join, the call that brought you here today is no different from the call that brought to get together the women of Seneca Falls. It is no different from the call that brought together the native wounded knee protesters. It is no different from the call for the Montgomery bus boycotts. And to bring it home, it's no different from the call heard and heeded by Homer Plessy, by Paul Trevine, and Louis Charles Rudiné. And for the here and now, we learn our historic memory. We mark our place physically for the world to know, and we celebrate. La Creole Research Association is proud to give back to our community in this way, in its 300th year of our city. It is truly our tricentennial moment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. At this time, we will have a few remarks from one of the pioneers uh, in the research on the New Orleans Tribune and on its founder, Dr. Louis-Charles Rudiné, Dr. Laura Ruzan who is an author and researcher and the retired dean of the College of Professional Studies at Dillard University. Thank you, you Ms. Donnelly. And good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, La Creole, for having me here to share my reflections on Dr. Rudiné and his powerful black press. I first heard about Dr. Rudiné in graduate school. Unfortunately, I did not hear about them in grade school or college. So I was surprised to find out that a group of black men in New Orleans had owned and operated a radical newspaper called L'Union, which turned out to be the first in the South. And I could hardly believe that L'Union's successor, La Tribune, was the first black-owned daily in the United States. I was moved by what I learned, that I felt that I had the obligation to expose others to the issues that these newspapers championed, and to the attitudes, beliefs, and values that these men passionately held. I felt the necessity to let students and teachers in grade schools and in colleges know that these newspapers were instrumental in starting an equal rights movement here in New Orleans and beyond. So I asked myself, how could a black owned newspaper have the audacity to advocate for universal liberty, justice, and equality at the start of the Civil War 
and live to print other copies? <laughs> In order to answer this question and others, I wanted to actually read the newspapers and look for issues that were covered primarily on its first pages. My research took me back home to New Orleans where I had the privilege to meet with the late scholar and author, Dr. Joseph Logsdon. He sent me to UNO's library where I began what I call my love affair with the men in their newspapers. Why? Because I spent long hours and many days reading and copying the journals. Armed with this first-hand knowledge, I set out to spread the word to my students at Xavier University and to others by developing a course on the black press and donating bound copies of the front pages of Lunion to Xavier's library. In order to teach and reach even more people, I became a member of this organization, La Creole, through Barbara Trevine, who played a major role in my research and whose ancestor is Paul Trevine, a long-standing editor of the newspapers. I also met other historians like Sybil Kine, Rob Flores, uh, Karen Bell, Jerry Honoré, other people, Nat Nathalie uh, Des Dessens, uh, Dr. Rankin. Uh, Jerry Honoré had a genius then and now that far surpasses his age. Uh, and he assisted me in developing a presentation about the doctor in Atlanta. I received much information and lots of help from Greg Osborne, who with his vast knowledge of Louisiana history and the New Orleans Public Library helps anyone who is interested in any aspect of Louisiana history. Y'all know that about Greg. Still spreading the word, I was fortunate to meet Beverly McKenna, who asked me to write an article about Dr. Rudinay and the newspapers in her Tribune, which bears the original newspaper's name, and to whom I was pleased to give a copy of one of Dr. Rudinay's pictures. The highlight of my research and outreach came when Mark Rudinay contacted me wanting information about his great-great-grandfather. As you can see, Mark spells his name R-O-U-D-A-N-E, accent that good. Mark and his brother Matthew later joined Jari and me in St. Louis Cemetery Number no. 1, where we were pleased to show them Dr. Rudinay's tomb. As a result of these relationships and others, the subjects of Dr. Rudinay and the newspapers became an exciting part of my life. I developed a sincere appreciation and respect for the doctor's ethical character and his passionate mission to bring liberty, justice, and equality to the people he represented. He truly believed that he could not be free unless every part of him was free. Today, I feel that my initial research and outreach has come full circle. Now, some children in the primary and secondary grades are beginning to see Dr. Rudinay's name in some social sciences texts, and universities have courses in black studies or communication studies, where a segment is usually devoted to black media. Today, noted scholars here will share their research with you, and La Creole will place a wonderful marker at the building where the newspapers were once printed. Today, I'd also like to share with you some things that I would like you to remember about the doctor that I personally cherish. Remember that he was a man who could have lived a good life by practicing medicine in Paris. Instead, he made New Orleans his home. In New Orleans, he could have had and maintained a lucrative medical practice without experiencing death threats. Instead, he became a political activist 
putting him and his family in constant fear of their lives. He could have had the right to vote. Instead, he refused the offer because his people were denied that right. Finally, he could have passed for white, as some do. He chose to live and die as a black man who was proud of his African ancestry. And so today, I am thrilled to see that New Orleans is finally giving Dr. Louis Charles Rudinet and the men of Lunion and La Tribune the recognition that they have without a doubt earned. I thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Ruzan, for those very heartfelt and meaningful uh, remarks. We now move on to the four principal presenters for this afternoon's program. The first being Dr. Raphael Casimir, Jr., who is a retired professor of history from the University of New Orleans. Dr. Casimir is a native of New Orleans and a product of his public schools. He received his bachelor and master's degrees in history from the University of New Orleans and the PhD degree from Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Dr. Cashmere was a full-time member of the history department at UNO from 1971 to 2007 and retired with the rank of Serafia G. Leda, university teaching professor. He has been actively involved with the local NAACP since 1960 and has held numerous offices in the organization. He has served on a number of governmental boards and commissions, including chairman of the Vieux Carre Commission for three terms, as well as a founding member of the Louisiana Black Culture Commission. He is married to Mrs. Inez Hale Casmina, and they have one son, a daughter, and one granddaughter. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Raphael Cashman. I first heard about Le Yun and uh, Le Tribune from the late A.P. Chiro, attorney Chiro, and uh, Joseph Lawson, who was my professor and mentor at the University of New Orleans. We put together a little organization called the Archives of Louisiana in an attempt to bring together scholars, not just African Americans, but those who were interested in pulling together the kind of research that finally came together with like Creole. And so I am very pleased to participate in today's program. In 1831, a young abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison, launched the Liberator to publicize his new anti-slavery crusade which reverberate throughout the country. In that first issue, he said, I will be as harsh as truth and uncompromising as justice. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I shall be heard. Eventually, he so enraged slaveholders that they put a price on his aid as they tried to silence him. But despite death threats, he was heard. Garrison refused to compromise, as he called the Constitution, which recognized slavery, a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. He refused to vote because he did not want to participate in a government which sanctioned the sale of men, women, and children like cattle. Although Garrison spoke from the relative safety of Boston, he faced hostile mobs, and on one occasion a rope was placed around his neck and he was beaten by a white mob and only the intervention of the police saved his life. In 1847, another young man, Frederick Douglass, launched his newspaper, The North Star, saying, right is of no sex, truth is of no color, God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. Douglass lived at various times in Boston and Rochester. He too was attacked for his faultful attacks, not only against the institution of slavery, but all limitations on human freedom. Douglas embraced absolute freedom of association, including the right to marry, irrespective of race or color. He was once beaten so badly that he never recovered full use of one of his limbs. In 1864, another young man, Louis C. Rudinas, who had brought his education in revolutionary France, stated his inaugural issue, we inaugurate today a new era in the South, we proclaim the Declaration of Independence as a basis for our platform. You who aspire to establish democracy without shackles, gather around us without fear, without hesitation. Contribute your grain of saying to the 
construction of the Temple of Liberty. We didn't have smoke from New Orleans, the chief slave mark in the South. But only a few years ago, he probably would have been put to death by a house of fools. These three men, one white, the other two biracial, born within a quarter century of each other, all shared common traits. They hated slavery but embraced slaves. They were visionaries who worked to create an inclusive society which recognized all of God's children as equal before the Lord. They opposed both black and white contemporaries who accepted race-exclusive schools and public accommodations. Each had faith in the full capacity of Africans to achieve on a level equal to anyone. Each man was forced to use his own personal funds to support their fledgling the newspapers. At the time of their death, although their initial goal of emancipation had been met, a conservative backlash had already begun to chisel away at the gains that they had made. Today, we come to dedicate the site where Dr. Rudin has first published the Tribune. However, to paraphrase Abraham Lincoln, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate. The courageous work of Rudin Ash, Garrison, and Douglas more than one and a half centuries ago have already hallowed this site, far above our ability to sanctify it. It is for us to live and rather to rededicate ourselves to finish that great work they began. Let us resist the siren calls of those who tell us to abandon the goal of a racially inclusive society because of current opposition from the White House to the outhouse. Let us be bold and dare to dream again of a society where all of us are working together for all of us to enjoy to the fullest the bountiful life that God initially designed for us. Thank you again, Dr. Kashmir. We now welcome uh, to the podium one who has worked to perpetuate the legacy of Dr. Rudine as the founder and publisher of the contemporary New Orleans Tribune. Mrs. Beverly Stanton McKenna, co-founded the Modern Tribune along with Dr. Dwight McKenna and has led the McKenna Publishing Company since 1985. An English major at Indiana University, she holds a bachelor's degree from Tennessee State University. Ms. McKenna taught high school in Washington, D.C., followed by a position as a public information officer for the government of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Her journalistic instincts and determination to continue the work of the black press in the tradition of the 19th century L'Union and Tribune led her to work with today's New Orleans Tribune. In addition, in 2007, Mrs. McKenna, along with Dr. McKenna, opened the door to a sometimes hidden history in the creation of Le Musée de FPC on Esplanade Avenue in New Orleans. The museum examines and interprets New Orleans and American history through the lives of free people of color. We welcome to the podium Mrs. Beverly Stanton McKenna. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. I can't begin to tell you how humbled and honored I am to have been invited to speak with this illustrious group and to share this microphone. As you all know, Dr. Rudinay and the New Orleans, the historic New Orleans Tribune have had such a profound impact, not only on New Orleans, but on the arc of, the arc of justice that has spread throughout the country. It's been such a significant media uh, and I was invited today to speak about our personal intersection, Dwight and mine, with the New or historic New Orleans Tribune. How did we come to publish? How did we come to do this? I was a child who was reared uh, in the Midwestern community where the blacks were just totally ignored by the mainstream media. We weren't mentioned in the daily paper. Uh, unless there were very degrading comments uh, or in some instances dismissal. We were the bad guys. We did dope. We did drugs. We were corrupt. My parents, however, knew the importance of our knowing, and of course this was before computers, before CNN, 24 hours news, they knew that though it was in a small community in which I was reared, a community of maybe the size, a town the size of Baton Rouge, 
that it was necessary in our development, our view of ourselves and our world, that we be exposed to the contributions that black people were making all over the country, all over the world, that we knew who we were, and that we recognized that a lot of the demeaning, degrading, outright lies were untruths. Because what you read, what you see, affects your vision, your viewpoint of yourself. I really wanted to major in journalism. My parents, although they knew the importance of us being familiar with journalism, they thought this was a horrible idea. Mind you, back in those days, you'll never get a job. You know, guess what? They were right. <laughs> I came home from Indiana University after my freshman year in college seeking an internship at our daily newspaper. Went, you know, dressed up, knew I could write, I'm, you know, good and went to our daily newspaper. The woman looked at me, sat and talked, and told me, honey, we've never, they couldn't give me an internship because, honey, we've never had a color reporter before. So, 18 years old, in tears, going back in the high heel shoes in my daddy's office crying. You know, he was very sympathetic, empathetic, but he had told me so. I went back to school that next year, changed my major to English education and stuck in the field, writing, teaching, public information job, a very glamorous job in the Virgin Islands. So I did okay with that English uh, major. However, I was always drawn back to telling the story, to recording the narrative of black people, to share what I knew, what I learned in my life's travels uh, with a broader community. I met Dwight. Uh, in Nashville, we married, we lived in Washington, D.C., our children were born in D.C., um, where we were exposed and reading the Washington Post every day. In 1973, we moved here. I always knew I was coming to New Orleans. I love New Orleans. I feel very much at home here, but the daily paper left a lot to be desired. Think back, 40, 1973. Uh, again, stilted stories, twisted viewpoints, <coughs> Um, it wasn't good in terms of race relations, it wasn't in good in terms of what we saw of ourselves, and it did a, I thought, harmful, it was harmful in terms of forming self-opinion, self-ideas uh, about, you know, by younger people. So we decided at that point we wanted to do our own newspaper. You know, hey, this was an answer, we, we thought that was important. Although we were great admirers, had a great deal of respect for the Louisiana Weekly um, historical paper, fine paper, they were a, day, a weekly. And there were also on the scene at that time was Data News Weekly, which was relatively new at that time. It was an entertainment paper. So although we thought these were fine papers, we decided to do a monthly publication that would give us the opportunity to delve more deeply into the stories that we wanted to write about or focus on. We met two young gentlemen, Kermit Thomas uh, and James Borders, two brilliant young guys, and uh, sat around and talked about it. Again, I can draw parallels to Dr. Rudinay, Paul Trevine, et cetera, sitting and talking about the issues that they wanted to cover. Well, we did that and bravely started our newspaper. We were located on Esplanade Avenue, where we still are, but Mark Moriel happened to be a young law student, maybe 25, 26 years old. He lived right next door. And he would come every evening after work, and we would discuss the issues of the day, what was important, what we were going, the problems that the city was, was facing. So I say our editorial board came from a lot of various and sundry people who just came, they were excited about the paper. Eventually, Mark moved on, Jacques Morial, who I see here today, he has become one of the major people on my editorial board. He gives me perspective, he discusses with me. Um, as we did our paper, again though, we felt a great intellectual, spiritual, uh, emotional connection to Dr. Rudinay. He was a physician, Dwight is a physician, man of color, black man, Dwight. 
So, so many things, and we shared so many viewpoints as I read these powerful, strong ed 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 editorials of advocacy, resistance. The ideas that he promulgated through his pages were exactly what we wanted to do in our paper. In these 33 years, we have tried to do just that. And as I write, we say that Dr. Rudin is his spirit guides us. It guides us every day, every month as we now sit in our office, think about what we're going to write, what position, what viewpoint we will pr present. Um, we have not done this with a lot of financial success as a paper because guess what, again, you know, nobody really wants you. Our, our editorial, first of all, has never been for sale. And I'm glad of that, happy of that. Nobody could influence us, although we've been offered, you know, if you tone down, or we will cancel, you know, an, a contract if you continue in this vein. We've never sold out in that way. We've tried to always address the issues that we felt uh, or that other people close to us felt were the key issues of the day. We've talked about poverty, about health, about housing. One of the issues that we have discussed for the last 10 years <clears throat> over and over again is the danger we see public education in the city facing. You know, we think that that is a major problem that as the, this community faces. But we've tried to be true to our people, to the community, true to ourselves. Uh, and we would like to think that in these 33 years that we have made a difference. Um, we would like to think that Dr. Rudine would approve of the job we had done. And I would like to think that in 100 years, you know, maybe a group of, such as this one today will be coming back and studying, looking at, analyzing those editorials that we have written. Thank you. One of the underlying themes of our celebration this afternoon is the efforts to diversify the historical landscape uh, in our city, especially during this uh, tricentennial period. We have next Ms. Angela Kenlaw, who is a servant leader and community organizer dedicated to working alongside children, families, and community members through meaningful educational experiences and organizing. She can be found in the local schools alongside teachers and families, ensuring that children have access to a quality education and are engaged in grassroots organizing, along with her comrades from Take em Down NOLA and the New Orleans People's Assembly. And just a few words about those organizations. Take em Down NOLA is committed to the removal of all symbols of white supremacy from the landscape of New Orleans as, much as a much necessary part of the struggle towards racial and economic justice. And the New Orleans People's Assembly is responsible for organizing toward a Fight Back Manifesto, which is a 10-point plan of demands that drive the work of organizers. The People's Assembly opposes and will resist what harms our communities while building toward tangible solutions to allow the masses of working class people a chance to live lives that are healthy and whole, something that resonates quite clearly in the columns of the New Orleans Tribune in their efforts to secure work rights for laborers after the Civil War. Their motto is that everyone who breathes air, drinks water, or lives on the land of the earth is affected by the social and physical environment and must care and align actions accordingly with both ending what harms us and with building that which heals and is equitable. Ms. Angela Kimball. I'm very, very grateful to be with you all here today. I want to extend um, a true and sincere thank you to Mark Rudine for the invitation uh, to share these words. And I also want to thank uh, Mr. Leon Waters, um, who I'm excited who will be speaking after me because he extended an invitation to me in May of 2015 to a attend an event similar to this one. It was the 125th anniversary of the death of Dr. Charles Rudine. And I became um, very aware and very grateful that that paper existed and had the opportunity to learn more about the contents of that paper. 
And as I learned more about the contents of that paper, the contents became an inspiration for me. So I just want to take a few minutes to talk about how the legacy of the original New Orleans Tribune has had an effect on my life and the work that I do. When I think about what it means to live in New Orleans, I say to myself, there has to be a line that we determine in our minds if we're going to cross or not cross. When I think about the contents of the original New Orleans Tribune, I think about the fact that it was a true organ that said, we want to obliterate white supremacy. And I think it's very important to acknowledge that because the ways in which we decide to either support white supremacy, condone it, allow it to happen, or sign off on it, has an impact on the ways in which we decide whether or not we are making progress or hindering progress. I remember three years ago, people who I loved and admired in New Orleans said to me, you know what, Angela, you and your comrades from Take Em Down Nola, you guys are wasting your time. You will never see a symbol to white supremacy like Robert E. Lee come down in your lifetime. And when I stood to actually watch it come down in my lifetime, I realized that anything is possible. If people decide to come together and actually have values that they're willing to maneuver through with their sphere of influence and their platforms, anything is possible. So, what people did not understand about our work then, and I'm hoping that they will understand now because there's still so many more uh, symbols to white supremacy in New Orleans, is that this work was done in an effort to say, we have to expose what the problem is. People thought, you know, you guys are so concerned about symbols. You should be focusing on other things, all the other ills that we deal with. But we said to ourselves, those symbols represent systems. Systems that are intentionally designed to exploit and oppress people. So for all of the people who said, you know what? We're not sure about this work. We're not saying anything's wrong with taking down monuments, but we need to be focusing on other things. We're saying we've always been focused on those other things. Mm -hmm. And when we saw those symbols, we, we realized what they represented in a way that as long as they're allowed to exi exist, we're signing off on a white power structure that is intentionally and deliberately oppressing people in this city. So then I said to myself, if a person has a problem with the work, then show me the work that you're doing that I could support and align myself with to help obliterate all those other problems that were a bigger deal than symbols to white supremacy. I said, where are the people in the city that are saying to themselves, the generational wealth that exists in this city that's built off of the backs of enslaved people where are the contributions to say, there's over 100,000 hospitality workers in this city that help this city to exist and help this city to operate the way it does to bring in the $8.7 billion that this city is joyfully um, happy to announce. But those people work in this city and they don't make a living wage. They don't have full workers' rights. So. Clearly there's a disconnect. People say things like, you know, this is not that big of a deal. We need to be concerned about poverty. Well, poverty doesn't happen by osmosis. Poverty happens because when people are so caught up in their capitalistic greed and they want to collect money but they don't want to be able to share, they don't care about the people who actually make this city operate, the working class, they don't care about them. So they say, you know what? We're gonna focus on something different. We live in a place where we say we're rejecting chattel enslavement, but we're also in a state that has joyfully, joyfully swooped up our people off of the street and put them in private prisons. We also know that when it comes to mass incarceration, that doesn't happen by osmosis either. The criminalization of black brilliance helps to accelerate mass incarceration. And there has to be a point at in time where we're gonna say, we're not gonna tolerate that or condone it. We say we care about education, but we allow children to attend schools named after people who would have happily enslaved them. 
We have children attending schools where a slave owner's name might be bigger on their diploma than the child's name. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with the fact that we can have parents who we complain about. We say, these parents don't care about their children. They need to be actively involved in their lives. But I want to remind you, when people don't have workers' rights, when you live in a city with a $647 million budget that dedicates 63% of that budget to cops, jails, and reactive measures instead of proactive measures, you say you don't care about children. That's how you prove you don't care about children. When you dedicate only 3% of that budget to children and families, and only 1% of that budget to job development at a time where we say we want more people to work, well, there's a lot of people in this city working every day and still can't make ends meet. So I just really want to say that I am deeply excited because when we started the work of Take Em Down NOLA, we also said we wanted to promote and uplift anything that had to do with the Build Em Up NOLA compartment. And this is an example of Build Em Up NOLA. This is an example because if you're highlighting and celebrating something that is anchored in true resistance to exploitation and oppression, that's worth celebrating. We don't believe in erasing history. We just believe in teaching true history. We believe that we can take down symbols to white supremacy and build up systems that work for people. And we can do those simultaneously. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. We believe that it's important for us to not only talk about this thing and celebrate this thing, but live out the legacy through our sphere of influence. Everybody in this room has a sphere of influence. And you have to ask yourself, what do you do with that sphere of influence to minimize exploitation and oppression in people's lives? This newspaper that we're celebrating today, the two of them, anchored itself in a true understanding of what it meant to fight for a collective liberation. Not a, I made mine, so I'm okay, I'll stand in the corner and be okay, but to know that our um, liberation is bound up with one another's liberation. And until we walk that way and act courageously with the sphere of influence we have, we too are signing off on the oppression. Anytime we water down our words and water down the narrative that liberation is important and exploitation is still happening today in 2018, we contribute to the problem. And so yes, we understand that there's some courage that it takes and some sacrifice involved in this. But the people who we're celebrating today, the newspaper we're celebrating today, gave the primary example of that. And we would not be sitting here today to be able to have the freedoms and luxuries that we had, had it not been for people who decided that they were going to fight in spite of the challenges, fight in spite of the fact that their blood could be shed all over this concrete, all over this par these parish lines. And so I just stand here today to say that I'm deeply grateful for the way in which this celebration is happening today, but I don't ever want it to be a celebration that happens in word only. I want it to be a celebration that happens in an action-oriented way where we prioritize the lives of working class people because there's a lot of folks who don't even work in this city who are being oppressed in this city, who we include as part of the working class because we know at the end of the day, a change is possible. So just like we've seen four monuments to white supremacy come down in New Orleans, we feel like the rest of them need to come down too and we don't apologize for that. In addition to the fact that the same way those symbols need to be changed, the systems need to be changed. The systems that perpetuate the problems that we say we don't want. But the good news today, our collective power can make that happen. And if you believe that it can make it happen, then this celebration is not only for you, but for the generations to come. I thank you for your time. We are, we are quite fortunate in that a growing number of native voices, of learned and well-read voices, of diverse voices are joining the ranks of the city's tour guides and tour companies. And our final uh, presenter uh, this afternoon is Mr. Leon A. Waters, the chairperson of the Louisiana Museum of African American History and the manager of one of those companies, an ever-growing one, Hidden History LLC, which is dedicated to publishing, touring, and research. Mr. Waters is a native New Orleanian, an alumnus of Xavier University, and the publisher of On to New Orleans, Louisiana's Heroic 1811 Slave Revolt. This 300-page monograph is the story of the largest slave revolt in the United States, 
that occurred in St. John the Baptist, St. Charles, and Orleans parishes. He has been active for a very long time in the struggle for complete liberation for the African American nation and the social emancipation of the working class. He's married to Mrs. Alita Conan Waters, and they have three children, nine grandchildren, and three great grandchildren, and he is still a hard, hard worker. Mr. Leon Waters. Welcome to the name and La Creole organization for giving me an opportunity to participate in today's uh, celebration. Um, I have one criticism to make and one um, correction. Um, my criticism is to Mark Rudine that he should have done better and had me third. <laughs> <laughs> instead, of, instead of the fourth speaker. <clears throat> it's going to be very difficult to come behind Andrew. <laughs> and the second minor correction I have 18 now, not nine. <laughs> I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> I have a few brief comments to share with you about the, um, the Union and the New Orleans Tribune. And my brief comments are going to focus on what I call the philosophical struggle that would take place in the newspaper, that would take place in society in general. And so my talk is called The Struggle for Complete Emancipation is also a philosophical or ideological struggle. Now, during the early 1700s, the Louisiana slave trade got started. Our ancestors were brought from West Africa, unloaded on the West Bank in an area then called the King's Plantation. Today that area is Algiers. There's a marker near the ferry landing that acknowledges this fact. Boats would unload their human cargo on the West Bank Buyers would make their wholesale purchases, return to the East Bank, the French Quarter, and sell their human cargo through a network of slave depots numbering about 52 in the 70 to 72 block French Quarter area. France, who is credited for discovering this part of the world, installed two social classes on this territory, an enslaver class and an enslaved class. The enslaved class would socially create the wealth of this new colony, and the enslaved slaver class would probably appropriate that wealth. Two social strata would also be created. The free Africans, who acquired their freedom by, by a traitorous or treacherous act, and the free people of color, a privileged strata, some who were slave owners themselves. These social classes and strata had their world outlook, or their world view, or their own philosophy. They each had their vision of society, their vision or belief system of life, how life should be, how the state should be organized, how the economy should be arranged. And given their class position in society, some embraced the view of the exploiter or the thief or the dictator class, while others embraced the view of the liberator, the warrior, or the freedom fighter class. Most of us today live under a legal framework called the United States Constitution. But this land, New Orleans and Louisiana, lived under a legal framework called the Code Noir, or Black Code. The roots of this code date back to the year 1615. Article 2 of the Code Noir states, all slaves in the province must be instructed and baptized in the Catholic religion. This meant that the enslaved people had their philosophy, their worldview, or their world outlook stripped from them, and then was forced to embrace Catholicism. This seasoning process would get started during the early 1700s. The United States Constitution would arrive about, arrive about 1789. The Rights of Man by Thomas Paine would be on the street about 1793. The scores of revolutionary slave revolts of the African diaspora from Africa to the Caribbean would inspire the Haitian Revolution, which would result in the 1811 slave revolt, a heroic attempt to establish an independent black republic here. And the brilliant radical battles for freedom would continue thereafter. The oppressed are hearing, learning, and discussing these proclamations and declarations, as well as the revolutionary battles that are happening throughout the African diaspora. From these actions, they are encouraged to fight on. As we enter the period of the 1820s and 1830s, utopian socialist ideas are being introduced by several key philosophers, Robert Owens, Charles Fourier, Henry D. St. Simon. These thinkers are popularizing the ideas of what they envision as a better society, a freer society, with a freer state, 
in a free economy, a fair economy, or a non-exploitative economy. Some of these ideas are brought here and disseminated by the newspaper, The Communist, which, which started in New Orleans between 1850 and 1855. Later, two black newspapers emerged, first La Union in 1862, and later the New Orleans Tribune, July 1864. By this time, the understanding of the idea that a tenacious war, a civil war, or revolution is absolutely necessary to defeat and end the chattel slavery system has been embraced publicly. A revolutionary crisis has emerged. The former press is not willing to live under the old way, and the oppressor class can no longer rule in the old way. Both papers embraced the idea and popularized this idea, but both papers differed, differed in what kind of society should be erected after the defeat of the dictatorship of the slaveholding class and its tyrannical rule. The union's philosophy was the mouthpiece of the numerical few, the privileged social strata, the free people of color. The philosophy of the New Orleans Tribune was the mouthpiece of the numerical majority, the enslaved Africans, who, had, who, who became the vanguard in the revolution, the Civil War, led by the Union Army. To get to the advanced position that the New Orleans Tribune would adopt took a philosophical, illogical struggle between and among those members of the oppressed and oppressive social classes. Hence, the New Orleans Tribune became a very important champion for democratic rights and an organ for the popularization of revolutionary ideas. The Tribune was written in two languages, French and English. The French section was articles on philosophy. The English section was articles on agitation and organization. I urge all of you to study this paper. Tulane University has about 142 issues. The remainder, about 1,100, are online. I hope you can do better than me reading things online. <laughs> Therefore, the following the Civil War, one may ask, what were the outcomes of this fight? Number one, child slavery would be destroyed. Human beings could no longer be bought and sold. Number two, newly freed Africans had won some important democratic rights, right to vote, right to public education, right to public accommodation, et cetera. These gains were not given to us but were won in the battle with the oppressor class. But counter-revolution would get the upper hand. The Republican Party, in league with Northern industrialists, would accomplish their objective, the replacing of child slavery with free slavery, which is wage slavery. With that mission accomplished, the former ally, the Republican Party and Abe Lincoln, would betray the interests of the former enslaved Africans and assist in the restoral to power of the former oppressor class. With the restoration of the former oppressor class to state power, the oppressor class outlawed the democratic gain that our ancestors won, the rights to vote, and all the other gains they won. It will take almost 100 years to rewin what our ancestors had already won. And that would happen in the 1960s. I'll tell you how far we're behind. With the counter-revolutionary defeat of Reconstruction, child slavery would eventually give way to capitalism intermixed with semi-feudal forms of exploitation of the black masses. Africans in the countryside now became sharecroppers and tenant farmers who were weighed down by debt, slavery, and cruel Ku Klux Klan terror. In the process, Africans, particularly in the black belt section of the United States, would mold into a nation or a people different than before. They would become African Americans. They had a common territory, common language, common economy, and life manifested in a common culture in the South, particularly in the Black Belt South. Today, we who are black are not completely free. It is my opinion that we must embrace the lessons of the newspapers to assist us in our fight today. A very important lesson is that there must be a struggle, philosophical, ideological struggle, against the incorrect ideas that we confront. Because we live in a class society, it is inevitable that there will be opposing views or ideas but such a struggle is absolutely necessary. So we have to get used to the idea that such a struggle is required to defeat and rout those who spread such non-progressive and wrong ideas. Let me give you an example. The brilliant lady, Dr. Juliana Malibu, for instance, wrote writes an article that's spread to all the black newspapers in the country where she denounced the fight to remove the white supremacy monuments that got started in New Orleans. She, she, her argument was there's more important things that should be done. The truth is, all these things are not mutually exclusive. They all are connected. They all are connected. But by making these incorrect statements and then disseminating through newspapers across the country, it hurts the fight. Instead of embracing the young people who are leading this fight to widen the fight and make it even stronger. 
Today, the road to complete emancipation is blocked by the philosophy or ideology of what I call reformism and its reformists. And its different varieties, opportunism, revisionism, anarchism, liberalism, as exemplified today by the modern civil rights industry. The urban league is the leading force today of the modern civil rights industry. But they, they take the same stand of the, of, 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 the inc of the oppression that's carried out by the oppressor class in this country, particularly around the privatization of, of public schools as well as other important issues. I believe we must return to the revolutionary road to obtain complete emancipation today as that road has been blazoned by Louis Charles Rudinet and his colleagues, men and women, of the Tribune. I believe we must embrace the movement led by Take Em Down and widen the struggle to that of all USA campaign, embracing all the righteous demands of the oppressed workers, men and women, and youth. We were successful in getting one foot of oppression off our backs in the Civil War. We still have one more foot to get off our backs today. It's called wage slavery. We have a world to win. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to share these ideas. Before we have some concluding remarks uh, from the Louisiana Creole Research Association, we have a very welcome addition to the program, uh, Mr. John Pusio, who is the Chief of Staff to the Honorable Latoya Cantrell, Mayor of New Orleans. Mr. Pusio. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to offer a brief welcome on behalf of the Mayor. Um, I would also say personally, um, not just as a representative of the administration, but um, as a representative of this proud culture, um, my, my mom is an honoree, my, my uncle is General Russell honoree. Um, I'm very proud of being um, of this place and of these people. And um, I think the more and more that we look at the history of um, what has happened before us, we see the relevance of what is happening today. And um, I, so again, I, I come not just to offer welcome, but also to learn and I'm very appreciative of being able to be here with you. Thank you. Before we make our way around the corner for the marker unveiling, we will hear again from the principal co-sponsor of this event, uh, Ms. Chantelle Nabon, who serves as Vice President of the Louisiana Creole Research Association. Um, on behalf of the board, and uh, we have a lot of La Creole members here, we thank you all so much for being here. Um, and helping with organizing this event. Thank you to the HNOC for hosting the forum. This is great. Uh, special thanks to the Rudinay History and Legacy. Thank you, Mark Rudinay, for your inspiration and vision. And thank you to many of the groups who are here representing the research and the education of a beautiful culture. Um, we have a lot of cultural and research affiliations throughout our city, so look them up. You'll be very pleased and very inspired. Um, thank you to everyone who is in attendance for making history with us on this day. Thank you to our speakers for your insight and inspiration. I was taking notes like I was in college, so I have to say um, thank you, Mr. Waters, for your reference to the struggle and recognizing the importance and the embracing of the fight. Oh, victory, huh? Thank you to Ms. Kinlaw for your vision and will to educate and promote the change and justice that we need. Thank you, Dr. Casimir a longtime family friend. He and, I gotta say this, you know, it's New Orleans. His daughter and I went to school together at McDonald 15, <laughs> Creative Arts Magnet School, and I used to have play dates at their house and just learned a lot. And you've been in my life for a lifetime, so thank you so much, Dr. Casimir. And thank you for your history of sharing these pioneers that we so recognize. Thank you, Ms. McKenna, Beverly McKenna, for you and your husband, Dr. McKenna, and your family for carrying on the legacy of this publication. Um, we're going to now move on to the marker unveiling, which is going to be right around the corner um, at 527 Conti. And then a special note for those of you who are wearing the blue um, armbands, uh, if you utilize our transportation services, we'll all be meeting together after the marker unveiling at Decatur and Bienville, I believe. But just follow the crowd. Thank you, for everyone. Well, good afternoon once again. We gather here at the office, the former offices of the New Orleans Tribune to dedicate this marker, believed to be the first marker dedicated to African American history in the French Quarter. Dr. Rudinay along with his elder brother, Jean-Baptiste Rudinet, the publisher of the Tribune, and Paul Trevine, its fiery editor, were men who were visionaries. Men who recognized, as Frederick Douglass did, 
that all that had been fought for in theory in the Civil War had to be accomplished in fact in the Reconstruction period. As we've heard this afternoon, that period of reconstructing America, to include all of us in that American assertion, we the people, is still ongoing. But today we pause for a brief moment to honor the legacy of Louis Shaw Rudinay and Paul Trevine. With us this afternoon, we have Madame Barbara Trevine, who is a descendant of Professor Paul Trevine, the editor of the New Orleans Tribune. Thank you very, very much. It certainly is an honor and a privilege. Since we are all here to celebrate an unveiling of this very historic and important moment in Louisiana's 300 years of celebration, and we are included in the history of Louisiana. And we need more markers up. That's we right. need to be That's inclusive, right. not exclusive. And I've worked very, very hard in bringing my ancestor, my third ancestor, my um, third great grandfather and Paul were brothers. And to bring this to the forelight was years and years of research. And I'm so happy that other people picked it up and they were able to add on to that narrative of these men's lives. And they worked very, very hard for everybody that worked here for freedom and to be thought of as a human being for civil rights and to be given equal rights for all men, free and enslaved, because people were freed at that time, but we were still marginalized. And they worked very, very hard for all of that. And they did live to see a lot of their, 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 their strides accomplished, but there was a lot more that they wanted to do. But time did not permit, and they were called to another destination. And we were left to carry that on. So all of us have to take responsibility in making this the United States of America a better place to live. Thank you. I just have to say that this afternoon's dedication is a culmination of over a decade's worth of work on a part of primarily one individual, Mr. Mark Charles Rudinay. Mark came to a recognition, to a knowledge of his descent from Louis Charles Rudinay about a decade ago. And since that time, it has become his life's passion, his life's work, to reclaim the legacy of the of L'Union and the New Orleans Tribune. He didn't have to do this. This history has been shut aside in his family for several generations. But he embraced it. He's adopted New Orleans as a second home. And he uh, has brought us to this uh, joyous occasion today. Mr. Mark Charles Rudinay. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Barbara. The defense of the weak against the mighty, of the oppressed against the oppressor, is a noble cause. It is a cause that we are proud to stand up for, in spite of all the obstacles that have been laid in our direction. We want freedom. We want justice. Justice for all. For this, we are prepared to give our best blood. For this, we are prepared to die. The New Orleans Tribune, March 5th, 1865. This building behind us that you're facing is hollowed ground. In this space, in this building, the South's first civil rights movement coalesced around two black newspapers, Le Union and the New Orleans Tribune. This marker is the first marker in the French Quarter to recognize black resistance and black achievement. A once hidden history is now made visible and now becomes part of the public memory. We have a right to this memory. We can claim it as our own. In this living museum, tens of thousands of people will now be able to walk past this building and learn and be inspired. Thank you very much. And finalement, the great moment has arrived. I 
building erected in about 1850. This building was the location of Le Union, the South's first black newspaper, 1862 to 1864, and the New Orleans Tribune, La Tribune de la Nouvelle Orléans, 1864 to 1869, the first black daily newspaper in the United States. These radical journals condemned slavery and fought for the rights of all of African descent. The black community rallied around the Tribune and organized one of the most important civil rights campaigns in American history. The creation of a groundbreaking state constitution with strong equal rights provisions and the election of many black state representatives. 